Now, broadcasting on Rockstar Worldwide from the Double Wide Production Studios, this is the Home Movie Legacy Project with your host, Rhonda Vigent. I got a night on the camera. I love to take a photograph. So mama can take my phone from the and her guests will share home movie stories that will tug at your heartstrings. You'll learn how to organize, digitize, share on social media, and use your home movies as genealogy research. Learn how to repurpose or even monetize found footage. This is the Home Movie Legacy Project. And now, here's your host, Rhonda Vigent. And welcome to the Home Movie Legacy Project where we focus on exposing real solutions to create a media legacy that lives. I hope you had a great week, everybody. I've had a great week. We've been just plugging away here in Burbank, as we always do, and um, having a great time just uh, moving forward to the home movie stuff. And today is a really special show for me. We're going to cover a topic we haven't talked about before. So grab yourself a glass of water, nice tea, or your beverage of choice for 4 o'clock, and uh, get ready for a great hour of innovation, inspiration, and information. And I'm so glad you could join us. So today we're going to be talking about a topic we haven't talked about before, and it's one that actually comes up for most of us every day in some form or another. And one of the things that I'm finding really interesting in preparing for the show today is the whole idea that the history of late night television has a legacy in and of itself. And so the legacy of late night television and it has had a tremendous impact and influence on America. It's a noteworthy topic to look at as it relates to Home Movie Legacy Project because I think the whole idea of late night TV has created a legacy in and of itself that lives on and on and on. Um, it's a genre that is really kind of interesting how it evolved. So in preparing for the show today, I did a, bit, a little bit of research. So. Um, I'm glad to be able to share with you a little bit of a history lesson that hopefully you'll find as fascinating as I did. So late night television is a genre in and of itself and it evolved as such an integral part of TV broadcast in American life. It has been a topic of controversy, competition and culture that has fascinated the American public for decades and the shows and their hosts have helped to shape us as individuals and as a society in countless ways. I'm sure most of you have an opinion on that and I think you would agree. One of the things that I learned in researching the early roots of late night TV is that the early roots really evolved from the radio era that as television became an integral part of American entertainment, the popular radio variety shows that people listened to sort of morphed into the early television shows that people watched. And so, you know, there were variety shows such as the Ed Sullivan Show, the Ed Sullivan Show which aired on CBS on Sunday nights from 1948 to 1971. And Texaco Star Theater with Milton Berle, which aired on NBC from 1948 to 1956. And in those days, those, sheer, those shows aired once a week in evening slots that we called prime time because they were sort of early evening and the kids were up and they had very much of a family feel to it. It was entertainment that the whole family could enjoy. But as television started to grow and as consumers wanted one media, tele te television execs soon recognized that they needed to fill in what we called the graveyard shift. Those later hours in the evenings after the kids went to bed after the news. And so they, in 1954, decided to try a new version of television. And what they did is they launched these late night TV shows. The first one being The Tonight Show with Steve Allen in 1954, debuting on NBC. The show created many modern talk show staples that included opening monologues, celebrity interviews, audience participation, comedy bits, musical performances, and it proved to be very successful. Now, while its first host, Steve Allen, left the show after a few years to pursue other types of, you know, variety shows, the Tonight Show continued with a second host named Jack Parr. And Jack Parr, who took over in 1957 and hosted until 1962, was the idea who introduced that maybe these late night shows should have guest hosts. And one of his regular hosts was Johnny Carson. 
Carson eventually went on to replace Parr as The Tonight Show host, and he remained in that spot until 1992. So that's where our story begins. But before I introduce my esteemed guest today, Dave Berg, who worked on The Tonight Show after Carson departed for 18 years as Jay Leno's co-producer and author of the book Behind the Curtain, an insider's view of Jay Leno, I just have one commentary I'd like to make about the Carson years. And that is, you know, I always like to draw upon my personal experience and why I feel so passionate about a certain topic. And for me, you know, the t late night TV represents a connection with my dad who passed away when I was 26 because he worked late and every night when he came home from work at 10 o'clock my mother would prepare his late night supper and we would prepare to sit down and watch Johnny Carson. It was the only time of day that I could connect with my father. This was a tradition that I continued as a college student, spent many evenings taking a studying break to watch The Tonight Show and then between 1985 and 1991 I rocked a baby many a night <laughs> during a late night feeding watching The Tonight Show and late night TV. So I think like many Americans, those of us who watch late night TV feel very strongly about it. And so I could not be more thrilled to have as my guest today, the person who helped Jay Leno carry the torch after Johnny Carson, a very important legacy, Dave Berg. So welcome to our show, Dave. Thank you, Rhonda. I am overwhelmed with the research that you've done on the history of late night I have my own story about Johnny Carson, if you'd care to hear it. Sure, I would love to. So let's kick off the show with that. Okay. Watching The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson actually represents a rite of passage in my life because I, like you, watched it with my parents. But I didn't do that early on when I was younger. I wasn't allowed to watch. And I think that's true of, of a lot of us. Uh, from from that generation, the kids weren't really allowed to watch until a certain point in their lives. And I, I'll never forget when my dad came into my room and said, would you like to watch Johnny Carson with your mom and me? I said, yeah, <laughs> yes. This mysterious show that I wasn't allowed to watch. Finally, I get to go in and see what it's about. And I remember the first time watching the show, seeing the monologue and all the jokes, and some of them are a little bit naughty. <laughs> and then hearing some of the wonderful stories the guests told, some of them a little naughty. <laughs> and, and I remember not even getting half the jokes, and I'm thinking, okay, how do I handle it? I know. I'll just laugh when my dad laughs. <laughs> so that'll tell him I have every right to be in here. And I'm telling you, that was a rite of passage. And I was, that's exactly what was on my mind the day I went in and applied for a job at the show. Which is remarkable. And so I think many of us, as I said at the beginning, have a very strong feeling about late night one way or the other. So you just wrote this amazing book called Behind the Curtain, an insider's view of the Jay Leno Tonight Show. Um, so initially, I want to ask you, what was your background before you got the job as a producer for Jay Leno? Had you worked in this part of the business? I had absolutely no experience whatsoever in entertainment. I had a background as a journalist, first in print and then television, and I ended up as a, a producer at NBC News at the Bureau in Burbank, uh, going on from there to be the Bureau Chief for CNBC, which was owned by NBC. And an opportunity opened up for me one day, which was they fired me. Okay. And I, I realized at that point that, uh, oh my gosh, down the hallway, because I, I was sort of decompressing and I went down the hallway after I had been fired and, I, I, and it says, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. And I thought, wait, I didn't know they were our neighbors. What, what's this? The show hadn't been on the air yet. They were three months out. Well, the first thing I did is I went back to my office. I called my wife, Mary, and I said, oh, my gosh, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno is a neighbor of, of, of our, there, uh, Jay could be in the office right now. She said, that's great. What are you going to do now? And I said, I know. I'm going to get on the phone. I'm going to apply for work. I'm out of work. I get it. She said, yes, you're going to apply for work. You're not going to get on the phone. You're going to go down to that office. Well, what am I thinking? I'm thinking of watching Johnny Carson with my dad and my mom. Right. And this 
this incredible show that's that's in a league way beyond my capabilities. Besides, I've never worked with a celebrity in my life. Well, I news celebrities, you know, politicians, newsmakers, the mayor of this town, presidential candidates. But I didn't have that background. But Mary had been encouraged. Let's just say she had been encouraging me encouraging me all day every <laughs> every hour on the hour she kept calling and saying so have you met Jay Let yet is he an interesting guy tell me you know finally it's four o'clock she called and she said have you filled out the application I'm intimidated you right, know right but when I said no I haven't done it yet but but I'm gonna do it and she said good go down there because if you don't you know maybe you want to go to McDonald's before you come home right so right I thought, okay Kudos to Mary. We all need to push our men out of our comfort zone sometime. <laughs> and I was pushed. It was less intimidating to go down there, which is what I did. I right. went down, filled out an application. The uh, receptionist said, hey, I want to congratulate you. I said, for what? I got the job? What job? I don't even know. She said, you are the last person to apply. The deadline is at 5 o'clock. It was 4.50. Wow. You're the last person. Two minutes later, the executive producer, who was in an office nearby, called me in and said, where have you been? I'm looking for a journalist. Two days later, I'm shaking Jay Leno's hand. That's just a great story, and congratulations. And I know it's just been a journey ever since. Yes. So my question is this. You know, those of us who know The Tonight Show and just know Hollywood, because we live here and work here, it's tough. And you have to work with the most high-profile demanding, eccentric personalities on the planet. I know when I get a person who calls me even upset about something and starts laying into me about something using, you know, profanity or unkind words, that I'm just a wreck for the rest of the day. How do you manage your career? How did you stay so calm and grounded? Well, first of all, we're, we're in the same business. Right. We're both in Burbank, which we both know is the real Hollywood. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and we were all part of the same business, the entertainment business, which has many, many aspects. And, and I think we both know that there were a lot of big egos yes. in every aspect of the business. Your, your part of the business, my part of the business. The thing that saved me was the fact that the boss, Jay Leno, was a normal guy, a down-to-earth guy, <laughs> right? And and he's the one that kept it stable there. Of course, there were there were huge egos. A lot of times, it wasn't so much the actors as their agents, their managers, their publicists. I don't need to tell you right, that, right? Right. And so, but what what kept me grounded, other than my wonderful wife and family, would be the fact that the boss himself was down to earth. He never once raised his voice in the 18 years that I was at the show. That's fantastic. Well, in reading your book and in the subtitle, you certainly did have two jobs, one behind the curtain and one in front of the camera. So how did you find enough hours in a day? I got exhausted just reading the book. Did you clone yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I don't think I was working any harder than you right here in your own business. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, it was 24-7, and I know people are critical of cell phones, and they say people are addicted, and I've heard that many times. You're addicted to, 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 the, to this phone. But honestly, when the cell phones came along, it was actually a blessing, mm -hmm. because what people used to do is stay at their office until 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. night. The phone allowed me the freedom to go home at the end of the day, have dinner. Now, of course, I was on the phone from time to time, but at least I was at home. Okay, and then we're going to be going to commercial break in just a minute, Dave, but one question I've always wondered, because I've known you for a long time, did you watch the show at night before you went to bed? I never once watched the show. <laughs> I, I, it made me too nervous. It was like working, and I was nervous, so I never, I've never watched the show. Interesting. And that's great because I agree with you. You know, your work is done. You take pride in it and then you get up and you do it the next day. Don't go away, everybody. You're listening to the Home Movie Legacy Project here on Rockstar Worldwide with my guest Dave Berg, who's written a fantastic book called Behind the Curtain, an insider's view of Jay Leno's Tonight Show. We'll be back after this break. Take 
raising the consciousness as to why home movies are so important. This is the Home Movie Legacy Project with Rhonda Vigent. And we'll be back with more right after these on Rockstar Worldwide. DC Live. An insightful, entertaining look into all aspects of the music industry. Join producer, songwriter, musician, and former Air Supply and Eddie Money bassist Don Cromwell as he brings you live performances and interviews with new artists, songwriters, and behind-the-scenes professionals, as well as a vast array of musical talents and personalities. DC Live connects you with the artist. You'll never hear music the same way again. Host Don Cromwell brings you DC Live. Tuesdays, 9 p.m. Eastern, right here on Rockstar Worldwide and on demand 24-7. Rockstar Worldwide from Double Wide Productions. Are you excited about getting your home movies and photos organized, but don't know where to start? Well, the Association of Personal Photo Organizers, www.appo.org, can help. The photo organizers are made up of a community of people. They're organizers, photographers, graphic designers, storytellers, historians, people just like you who love photos, home movies, and most importantly, the stories they tell. Through training, education, networking, and collaboration, the Association of Personal Photo Organizers strives to advance this new and growing profession of photo life management. Our hundreds of trained personal photo organizers specialize in helping you rescue your irreplaceable photos and home movies and organize them in ways that make it simple to share your memories, lives, and traditions. Our goal is to help you make those distant memories tangible so you can cherish the life that you share with others. If you need help, look for a personal photo organizer near you by going to appo.org. We are excited and ready to help. Welcome back to the Home Movie Legacy Project, showcasing compelling interviews with people who are telling their personal stories. Rhonda is all about preserving our visual heritage for generations to come before it's too late. So let's get back to the show. It's the Home Movie Legacy Project on Rockstar Worldwide. And here again is your host, Rhonda Vigent. And thanks for sticking with us through the break. And welcome back to the Home Movie Legacy Project, where I'm interviewing my guest today, Dave Berg, who's written an amazing book called Behind the Curtain, an insider's view of Jay Leno's Tonight Show, uh, where Dave was Jay's uh, co-producer for 18 years. So welcome back to the show. Thank you, Rhonda. So we went... Before we went to break, we were talking a little bit about what it was like working on the Tonight Show, what a typical day was, if there was such a thing, and the fact that when you got home, you didn't watch the show, which I think is a great thing. Um, you're a man of faith and can, and can call yourself conservative, which is something I greatly admire, and it's something that is very hard to maintain, particularly here in Hollywood. My belief is that these core values undoubtedly must have at some point come into conflict working into Hollywood, especially with these high-profile, demanding people that we're surrounding with. How did you keep cool, calm, and collective in the face of people who were just, you know, pushing the envelope at every opportunity? Well, I think it was challenging, but, but remember, my boss, Jay Leno, did, there was always that calming effect with him there as the anchor. But I think if you are a person of faith, you realize that probably the best way to deal with people is to show by example. And it's very hard to focus on that. It's never fun to be insulted. It's never fun when somebody is hurling profanities at you. That's never good. And believe me, uh, if you take into account my thoughts, <laughs> I'm not always a great person of faith, <laughs> but I always did try to show by example. So can you give me an example? Because like I'll have people that rip into me and they don't let me get a word in edgewise, and you just want to walk away or hang up the phone. How do you deal with somebody like that? That's a very challenging <laughs> thing, and I'd have to say sometimes things are so messy, you just say, this is just messy. I, 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 don't, I don't know how else to deal with it. Maybe you vent with your colleagues, but I found now I'm not saying that I, I didn't I, I didn't uh, slide I didn't slip and make mistakes and get into it with somebody, but it never never was smart. It was always better to just cut it off and go vent 
go vent with Mary at, right. at, at home or vent with colleagues and do it that way. It just, it, it never was good to get into a, a you know, a, 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 a fighting match. I agree. So you say Jay was kind of a regular guy, which I agree. He's very friendly. We see him driving around here in Burbank in all Burbank. the time. He'll always wave. You know, you run into him at the Italian restaurant. We're all from Boston, too, and we'll say, how's the Italian today? Very, very personable. But we also know he was kind of quirky in certain ways. Can you give us uh, some insight as to what that quirkiness was? Yes, and please cut me off if I go on <laughs> too long because he, I have to say, as, as good a guy as he is, he really is quirky. And by that, I mean um, he liked to do the same thing over and over again. I think everyone knows, most people know that he would wear a denim shirt and jeans. Um, he also ate the same lunch every day. Yeah, all right. He would switch it out about once a year. Okay. One year it would be turkey. One year it would be chicken. He ate the same meal every night, lasagna. He never uh, drank hot liquids, mm -hmm. coffee, tea. He never had alcohol. He never wanted to invest in stocks. He never ate uh, green, uh, vegetables. He never ate a salad. He and you're you're going okay enough and what's the point behind this story the point is he was so obsessed so dedicated to his job which was primarily taking care of the monologue mm -hmm. he did not want anything to interfere with that so even the idea of taking 5 minutes to choose an outfit to mm -hmm. wear to work for the day wasn't worth it for him he did not want to be bothered Johnny Carson, for instance, owned the rights to The Tonight Show that he was the host of. NBC offered him the rights. He took it. He was the boss of the show. To this day, his family administers the rights. Mm -hmm. They offered Jay the same thing, mm -hmm. and he said, no thanks, that's going to get in the way of writing monologue jokes. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about the monologue. How did Jay put the monologue together? He did it 24-7. He had about 20 writers. He, um, he had about 1,500 jokes submitted to him every single day. 1,500? Yes, 1500. Zero, zero. I know it's hard <laughs> to believe. And 24 jokes made it into the monologue. But he was such a perfectionist that he wanted to go over as many jokes as he could. How did he do it? Well, again, it was 24-7. He slept about three to four hours a night. And what really helped him in going through that many monologue jokes was his attention span, mm. which was about 10 seconds, mm. which may be due to his dyslexia mm -hmm. or that he's ADHD, whatever. He had a short attention span. And if you think about it, if you've got 10 seconds to give to each joke, you can get through 1,500. Absolutely. But how do you then select the 24 that you use? I'd be <laughs> overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm with you. That's that's where it is. Here's the thing about Jay, and, I, and I'm going to say this about him. I think that he had his finger on the pulse of the American psyche better than any of his competitors. I agree. And as I was preparing for this interview today and thinking about your book, because I read it twice, Thank one you. of the things I kept thinking about is, how do you poke fun of somebody on the one hand and then turn around and ask them to be a guest on the <laughs> show? You know, let's just use Bill Clinton as an example. Like, I just can't imagine. That takes a lot of it. We say in Jewish language, chutzpah, nerve. Like, how do you do that? And he did it so well. Yeah. But it's interesting that you mentioned Bill Clinton. He's the one guest. We, I, I will say we got every single major presidential candidate and president going forward from 1996 until the end. And that was part of my job, booking Fantastic. the political people. But there was one person I didn't get, and that man's name was Bill Clinton. I spent about 10, not about, 10 years trying to get him on the show. He never did it. And never said why. However, however, I've talked to many of his people over the years, and finally, finally, several of them admitted to me on the condition of anonymity, it was the Monica Lewinsky jokes. Yes. Well, I get that. I get that loud and clear. And so that brings me back to my initial question. How did Jay so brilliantly 
navigate those waters by poking fun with people and then did they come on the show to redeem themselves? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, that with his jokes, this is not true in every case because Jay wasn't perfect, but I think most people understood that the jokes weren't personal right? and he also had certain rules. As he said, I go by mafia rules. <laughs> you never go after the kids. You never go after the wife. You never go after the family. That's my rule. I just stick, you know, I, don't, I never make jokes about the president's kids. Just the president. Never make jokes about the first lady. Just the president. And that, that was his rule. A good rule of thumb yeah. for sure. So we know that Letterman was the main competition. Uh, the shows were very different. Um, I'm not a Letterman fan. I never have been. I would try to watch a few times and he just put me to sleep. Part of it was I loved my Boston boy. You know, I had a certain kinship with him. I could relate to him on so many levels. But this was an ongoing competition for many years. I got to have you to comment on that. Well, it, 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 it was a competition, and it led to many, many stressful moments for all of us because when we began the show, the critics had uh, remarked, first of all, they they said that Jay would never live up to Johnny. Then secondly, the, the critics, they, David Letterman was the darling of the television critics. I'll just say it, that was a fact. We all dealt with that. And they felt that getting The Tonight Show was David's birthright. Right. Right? Even though Jay got the show, even though, even to this day, you hear people saying, well, David Letterman's the king of late night. No, he wasn't. The guy that gets the most viewers is the king of late night. I don't care what you say, but that's not the way many of the television critics, um, that, that's not the way they looked at it. So this was a source of great friction, not only because of the critics, but also Letterman himself, who I believe felt, he felt that it was his birthright. It was his birthright to take this show. Now, he got another late night show on another network, but there's something about that name, Johnny Carson. I want the job that Johnny had. That meant everything to Letterman, just as it did to Jay. One thing that I think the Jay Leno show and Jay Leno's Tonight Show did very well is they made some changes that were very different once Jay took over. Could you talk a little bit about that? Things like changing studios and some other changes that you made to really make the signature of the Tonight Show a Jay Leno Tonight Show? Let's start with the studio since you brought it up and it might be the most interesting part and it ties in with Johnny Carson because in the first year our biggest competitor was the memory of the, of the iconic Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. How could we live up to Johnny? And not only that, many people don't know this. When we started out, it was in Studio One, mm -hmm. the very studio where Johnny had done the show for 20 years in Burbank, in that incredible studio. And there's, uh, you know, Johnny was alive. But the fact of the matter, all of us, including Jay Leno, all of us, it's like we felt Johnny's presence. Mm -hmm. It's if you did something, you had it, you booked a guest, they weren't so good. You, 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 there was a monologue joke, not so good. You're sort of like, ooh, Johnny wouldn't have. That's not up to Johnny's standards. Mm -hmm. So we really felt Johnny was in that studio. And it got to the point where Jay said, we have to leave. We have to go to another studio. Well, it turned out we went to another studio on the other side there was a there was a there was a corridor between studio 1 and studio 3 we went from studio 1 to studio 3 studio 3 had the exact same configuration it was the same in every way the dimensions were the same we could have just rebuilt studio 1 mm -hmm. but no we had to go to another place redesigned it built a stage based more on the saturday night live stage we had been in New York and we did the show from the Saturday Night Live studio. It was more colorful. It was it was wider. It was more intimate. Um, the the Johnny's audience had about 500 people. Johnny Johnny would do his monologue about 30 feet back from the audience because he was kind of a standoff. Uh, Jay wanted to do his monologue right up next to the audience. He wanted the audience smaller. So we reduced the audience from about 500 to 380. It was more colorful and more spread out. 
Yeah, I read in the book you were almost trying to create the feel of a comedy club in some respects, it, right? We, thank you. That's that's what I was searching for. So thank you for that, Robin. <laughs> yeah, and I think those were great, you know, choices that helped really, you know, create a Jay Leno signature and a legacy that's very identifiable even today. With a comedy club, as you've pointed out. Right, right. What was the turning point for The Tonight Show? Was there a particular guest? There indeed was. And, uh, you know, I, I will say this. On any given night, most of our viewers, we knew that the viewers gonna, were going to watch the monologue, right? But the fact of the matter is the monologue wasn't the most important part of the show. It was the guest because the monologue is on for a quarter of an hour. Right? right, but you're rated for an entire hour. Right, so it's all about have booking the right guests to keep the viewers throughout the hour. Now, the fact of the matter is, once David Letterman went on the air um, in 1993, he became number one. He was number one, and that went on for two years. And it got to the point that even the television critics were saying, "The late night war is over. David Letterman has won. It's over. That story's." You know, that ship has, has already sailed, except one day something happened. We booked a, a, a guest, uh, this was on July 10th, 1995. His name was Hugh Grant, an up-and-coming British star. And he had just done his first Hollywood movie, Nine Months. Here he was booked. R right after we booked him, he ended up on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. He was in a car with a young lady named Divine Brown. And they were doing a few things, and they were visited by a police officer and arrested for certain activities. And that story became viral before mm -hmm. the word viral was a word. Now, that was the biggest story in the world. And our challenge was not, gosh, how do we book the guy that's behind the biggest story in the world? The challenge was, how do we keep him? Tell me how much time I have to, to tell this story because go. I can, go, I can do the longer version of the shorter version. Let's go longer. <laughs> but this is one of my favorite stories okay. because this was a pivotal point right. in the history of The Tonight Show. Now, something you have to go back in time to understand this story. At that time, when celebrities were naughty little boys, they would run and hide in the corner. Mm -hmm. If they were booked on a show, canceled. Mm -hmm. Everything was canceled, which is exactly what Hugh Grant did. He canceled his appearance. We decided to do something unprecedented. We decided to convince him to stay on the show, and that's what we did as the producers. He would have nothing to do, nope, not coming on the show, until Jay said, let me try. He calls, and he talks to Hugh directly, and he says, Hugh, you know, we're friends. We broke you on, on late night television in America. We've always treated you right. And you know me. I'm not a guy that throws curveballs. I don't, I don't ask you gotcha questions. I want you to know that I'll treat you right. You should come on the show and you should do a mea culpa. You should apologize. Otherwise, your Hollywood career is tanked. Right. You're, what is it going to hurt? What do you have to lose? I said, oh, I'll think about it, right? His, his publicist calls back, oh, Hugh still doesn't want to do the show. Jay said, let me call again. He calls up and said, Hugh, believe me, this is going to work. I'll work with you. I promise. I'll only ask you one or two questions at the most. Then we'll move on to the movie. Hugh went for it. Mm -hmm. The night of the show, Jay's thinking, or the day of the show, the most per nervous guy around is Jay. He goes, what did I do? I only promised to ask one or two questions. What do I ask him, right? So finally he decides to ask, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> then as the day went on, he said, maybe I'll put a little twist on it. So he ended up asking him on the air, what the hell were you thinking, right? Well, this became viral in itself. I remember it. I could quote yes. it. <laughs> and Hugh agreed to end up to do his end of the bargain, he answered with a genuine apology, mm -hmm. a genuine mea culpa. He said, you know, Jay, I could say, um, when I was a kid, my mom pushed me down the stairs and I fell on my head. And that's why I, that's why I did this, Jay, but that would be bollocks. The fact of the matter is, you know when you do something right, and you know when you do something wrong, and I did something wrong, and I apologize. I'm paraphrasing. After that, Hugh's career went on, 
as if nothing had ever happened. The next day, we found that we had 13 million viewers. The average viewership was 5 million. We became number one that day, and that lasted for two decades. Amazing. Yeah, that was a monumental show. I even stayed up to watch it, and those were in the days that I was exhausted and often went to bed after the monologue. Yes, I understand. (laughs) You were a mom, right? You had to get up early with the kids. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So that's a great story. I also read in your book that there was a favorite guest. So who was that favorite guest? Well, I I have to tell you that um, I I favor the the political people, Mm -hmm. and so did Jay, uh, I'll say. And we both, our favorite guest was the same guy, John F. Kennedy Jr. And I think the reason is, first of all, This is a guy who was completely unique in American society at the time. The name Kennedy, and Mm -hmm. especially JFK Jr., meant, signified the equivalent of American royalty. He was essentially, more than his sister Caroline, I knew her, I had also, I had booked her. And he was something that was totally unique. And we all, our generation, we had all experienced his wonderful father as president who had been assassinated and the family had gone through those hardships. Well, here's the thing. I started calling on on, on, uh, JFK Jr. It took me six years Mm. to get him booked because he didn't think he was good enough. He did not think he was good enough. He didn't think he was Tonight Show material. Finally, when he agreed to be on the show, I got on the phone with him. And that's what you do. I mean, I didn't really know what you were going to ask me. That's how interviews go. But on The Tonight Show, an entertainment show, you kind of let the guests know. Right. Because what, what, it's an entertainment show and you give them sure. a chance to be entertaining. He, normally, I, I would do the pre-interviews in 10 minutes. He was on the phone with me for four hours. Oh, my god! And wanted to keep going because he didn't think he was funny enough. Oh, my god! Now, he was going to be on the same show as Jerry Seinfeld Uh and this intimidated him this intimidated the heck out of him because he figured uh, well first of all it was on the very last night of of Seinfeld Seinfeld Mm -hmm. I'm not even in the same category Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this guy is the the biggest name in show business Mm -hmm. I have no business being on with Seinfeld Mm -hmm. and the only reason he agreed to do it is is if he could if he could talk about make all his topics about Seinfeld he had been the subject of a Seinfeld show, okay. so he had a lot of funny anecdotes. Uh-huh. And the person who was most amused and bemused by him was Jerry Seinfeld. That's incredible. Right? And so there was wonderful chemistry between yeah. the two yeah. men. The audience was fab- flabbergasted, and if you look at the tape of JFK coming out, you see him mouthing the word, wow. He was overwhelmed that people would actually like him. That's a great story. That's a great story. And I can only imagine two icons being on the same show. I'll have to try to find. Are some of the reruns available? Here's the thing, Rhonda. And this is how the, the video legacy, which is the business you're in. Yes. I feel that so strongly because in the, in the first 15 years of, the, of our show, maybe even the first, yeah, at least the first 15, maybe the first 18, it's not like you could just go to YouTube and find any clip right. you wanted. There wasn't, there wasn't YouTube. The clips weren't put out. You didn't have blogs about each show. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of those clips are just gone forever. Mm. They're, they're, well, now NBC has them mm-hmm. in their archives, mm-hmm. but you can't get them. Right. The reason I was able to get a lot of these k- clips and keep them is because I would go to the University of Utah. They invited me there every year at the University of Utah uh-huh. to lecture students. Oh. They did that for a period of 15 years. Right, and right. I would cut clips to go okay. talk to them. And I kept the clips. Okay. And so, so that that legacy is is preserved for me. So that's your home movie legacy of it your is. years at The Tonight Show. That's right. It would be interesting to find out how to access those clips. So I might have to invite you to come to EMEA this year because those are all the Hollywood studio heads uh-huh. <laughs> that have the archiving yeah. issues that we all deal with in terms of storage yeah. and, and how to access that stuff and make it not only a teaching tool for future generations, but, you know, particularly with late night TV and the plethora of guests you've had, you know, it's, a, it's an enclave of history in and of itself. Well, you can access it, but mm-hmm. it would cost you several thousand dollars. So right. If you're a scholar, right, you don't have 
access to that. Right, right. Very interesting. Yeah, we all face the same issues in terms of archiving, preservation, and access, because yes. we all say that preservation without access is just stupid. Exactly. Right? Amen to that. So, one of the chapters in your book that really made me laugh was your babysitting Dennis Rodman chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I feel like we should at least talk about that a little bit. I just found it hilariously funny. Okay. I, I know I, I don't have much time to answer this, correct? A couple of minutes. All right. Move me along if I don't. Okay. Dennis and I went on to become really good friends. When he put out his last book, I was in the introduction. And so we were friends. But like all good friends, they have their faults. And Dennis's fault was... He, he was never on time. He was never on time. And so he lived in Orange County. I had to set, I would send a limo down to pick him, which I did forever, yes. He wouldn't get in the limo on time. Finally, I ended up having to send a helicopter down to John Wayne Airport. He'd get in the limo late. They'd take him to the helicopter. He got in the helicopter late. So no matter what I did, he would show up to the show late. So one day his agent booked him, God only knows why, on the Country Music Awards in Nashville the night before The Tonight Show. And and I called the agent. I said, you can't do this. What are you doing? He can't even make it to the show. And you're taking him 2,000 miles away. Well, I ended up going down to Nashville with him and following him, basically, you know, basically following them everywhere. And what did they do? They ditched me. <laughs> they just ditched me. We finally reconnected and he came on the show. That's a great story. Yes. I mean, that's really yeah. a great story. Yeah, I, I just laughed. Uh, I, folks, the price of the book is worth that story alone, so I'm glad that you didn't tell the whole story because maybe we'll get some more people to buy the book. I left out some <laughs> interesting parts like the strip show. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, so you got to read yeah. the book. Um, one of the other things that really caught me about the way that Jay did The Tonight Show and the kind of guests that you booked were that oftentimes things would break on The Tonight Show before they broke on the news. And the one that comes to mind specifically was when Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> announced that he was running for governor of California. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, the fascinating thing about that is Jay and Arnold, I'll call him Arnold, they were good friends. Arnold always, whenever he had a new movie coming out, he would always come and do The Tonight Show, and usually just The Tonight Show. He, he didn't do Letterman, so he was a very loyal guest. So when he decided that he might want to run for, for governor of California, to, to his way of thinking, well, it's only natural to go to The Tonight Show. And he made that announcement. Now, if you go back in time and you look at the stories, the California press and the political press, they were livid. How dare you go on an entertainment show? This is a serious subject. And you're going to go on Jay Leno? Are you kidding? Well, the fact of the matter is, as I said, going forward, we had booked every major presidential candidate uh, um, since 1996. So it was, it was really not illogical. But here's the, the real question. When did Arnold know he was going to announce? Because we didn't know it. His staff told us, don't worry, he's not going to announce that he's running for governor. He only said that he was thinking about it. He's not going to. He's only using this as a cover. He's really going to promote Terminator 3. <laughs> he's just using that as a cover to, to really build up the, the film. Well, the fact of the matter is, when he did announce, the people who were the most shocked in the studio were his staff. Unbelievable. Jay didn't even have any political questions. So it w really was a shock to all of us. And to America. Don't go away, everybody. You're listening to the Home Movie Legacy Project. We'll be back after this break. I got a knife on a camera. I love to take the floor. Raising the consciousness as to why home movies are so important. This is the Home Movie Legacy Project with Rhonda Vigent. And we'll be back with more right after these on Rockstar Worldwide. Are you excited about getting your home movies and photos organized, but don't know where to start? Well, the Association of Personal Photo Organizers, www.appo.org, 
can help. The photo organizers are made up of a community of people. They're organizers, photographers, graphic designers, storytellers, historians, people just like you who love photos, home movies, and most importantly, the stories they tell. Through training, education, networking, and collaboration, the Association of Personal Photo Organizers strives to advance this new and growing profession of photo life management. Our hundreds of trained personal photo organizers specialize in helping you rescue your irreplaceable photos and home movies and organize them in ways that make it simple to share your memories, lives, and traditions. Our goal is to help you make those distant memories tangible so you can cherish the life that you share with others. If you need help, look for a personal photo organizer near you by going to appo.org. We are excited and ready to help. If you are a family historian passionate about preserving and sharing family films and stories, a filmmaker wanting to move analog legacy or found footage into a digital project or documentary, a genealogy buff, memory keeper, or archivist, this show is for you. The Home Movie Legacy Project. Rhonda's passion for home movies and independent filmmaking stems from running Pro 8mm based in Burbank known as the Super 8 experts for production and legacy footage for over 30 years. They have worked on thousands of projects for moguls and the masses, including Hollywood blockbusters such as Argo, Super 8, and JFK, TV shows, music videos, commercials, and the personal family film legacy of the world's most famous faces, industry icons, award-winning documentaries, and archival footage for the presidential libraries and museums. Each show will focus on compelling interviews with people who are telling their personal stories using home movies as a jumping off point, sharing what was discovered or what was challenged or what was confirmed. Expert guests will share best practices to organize, digitize, socialize, and even monetize your old media formats and cutting edge ways to bring them back into your digital life. And don't miss the weekly Tech Talk segment featuring Phil Vigent, the other half of the Pro 8mm story. Learn insider industry secrets of how to become head of your own studio. Don't miss the Home Movie Legacy Project, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rockstar Worldwide. Welcome back to the Home Movie Legacy Project, showcasing compelling interviews with people who are telling their personal stories. Rhonda is all about preserving our visual heritage for generations to come before it's too late. So let's get back to the show. It's the Home Movie Legacy Project on Rockstar Worldwide. And here again is your host, Rhonda Vigent. And thanks for sticking with us through the break, where I'm interviewing Dave Berg today, author of the book Behind the Curtain, an insider's view of Jay Leno's Tonight Show. And before we wrap the show in the last few minutes, Dave, I want you to have a chance to tell people where they can buy the book. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I do appreciate that. You can buy it at, um, at Barnes & Noble if you want, and there are certain other bookstores, and certainly you can go to Amazon.com. Okay. And do you have any speaking gigs coming up where you'll be talking about the book or about well, your career? Yes, we were just, uh, we, uh, well, we, we just uh, uh, had a, a gig in Washington, D.C. at New York University, Washington, D.C. campus. And I just flew in yesterday from the University of uh, Utah. Um, what's the next one we have coming up? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, we've got uh, Master's College, which is in, uh, which is in uh, Valencia, California. Um, we have a, a writers' conference, the Willamette Writers' Conference, which is in Portland. That's coming up, and we have some book signings in Chicago. Fantastic! We'll so, in the few minutes we have left, I have three quick questions. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to fire them off to you, so you can pace your answers accordingly. Okay. What's next for Jay Leno? Okay. What's next for Dave Berg? And what do you think the future of late night TV is? All right. What's next for Jay Leno? He's doing it now. Uh, stand up. He's doing about 200 appearances uh, a, a year. We just saw him in Washington last week at the First Lady's Luncheon. Um, and so he loves that. He also has a car show, which is on the Internet. It's now moving to CNBC. Fantastic. And what's next for you after leaving such a chaotic career? Maybe you can help me figure it out, Rhonda. <laughs> you seem so organized, more organized. I'm a columnist for the Orange County Register, and I'm sort of toying with another book. I think what I might want to do is help my son, help him with, with his book, and then I'm, I'm looking at a few topics for that. 
And the third one was? Well, just the future of late night TV. How do you think Jimmy Fallon has done picking up the torch? Is late night TV changing? We're cutting the cord. A lot of people are cutting the cord. I mean, you know, there are so many things changing in the media industry that are going to have a trickle down effect on late night television. Yeah. I have to give Jimmy Fallon credit because what he did is he took an iconic institution now in its 61st mm -hmm. year, the longest running entertainment show on television, and he made it relevant for this generation. Maybe not so much me, maybe I don't get all of his humor, but the fact of the matter is, I think he represents the zeitgeist of this generation. Mm -hmm. He's very positive, he's upbeat, they like that. I think they're sick of the cynicism of the David Letterman's of the world. They like his upbeat, and they like his silly bits that he does with his guests. He's not so much about the monologue as he is about singing Neil Young songs better than Neil does. <laughs> Which, by the way, Neil Young is working on a new Super 8 documentary that we've just started, uh, you know, seeing the footage for a kind of an anti-Monsanto thing. Wonderful. I'm a big fan of Neil Young. They're honoring him this week at the IFP in New York City. And uh, just as a little side note, he... Um, his film, his film name, his filmmaker name is Bernard Shakey, and his company is oh. called Shakey Pictures. Huh. And uh, you know, I don't know that I'll get him on. Maybe you can help me. Maybe that's what I'll do. You're the one of the biggest gets I've got, so maybe you can <laughs> help me it. because we work with a lot of famous people, and the last thing they want to do is come on the Home Movie Legacy Project. Well, that's their problem. <laughs> they don't know what they're missing. Well, thank you, thank you. So, will people like Jimmy Kimmel and Conan survive in years to come? I think Jimmy Kimmel will. I, I think. I think Jimmy has his own approach to humor. He's uh, he's not. Uh, I, I think Jimmy Fallon has actually reinvented late night. Uh, but and I think Jimmy Kimmel is doing a terrific job. He emphasizes pranks a little more. That's kind of his specialty. Um, and I think it's the was it the the emails? What is it called? Nasty emails. I think that's so. funny. That's funny. Mean emails. I like that bit. I think Jim. I, I think that Fallon and Kimmel will be sort of be like Leno Letterman mm -hmm. without the contentiousness. Mm -hmm. I think Conan is an also ran. I think the train has left the station and left Conan behind. Um, he gets maybe maybe seven hundred and seventy five thousand. Jimmy Fallon gets four million. Jimmy Fallon has seven hundred uh, YouTube uh, subscriptions, and and Conan has two million. Uh, so anyway, so social media is now playing a large part. Is, huge. Were you instead of being as focused on ratings as you were in your day, are people now more focused on how many hits and likes and subscriptions you have on your YouTube channel and things like that? How many followers on Twitter? You just said it. I, if I said it, I'd just be repeating what you said. The problem is they don't quite know how to make money from right. it, but they'll figure it out. I'm sure they will. Yeah. What would Jay say is the legacy he's going to leave the world? Jay would say, I don't believe in legacy in television. Once it's over, it's over. It's off in the ether. That's why I wrote this book, because he doesn't care about legacy, but I think it's important to preserve his legacy. I think what he brought to Late Night is he took the monologue that Johnny did that was so excellent, but he took it to the next level. Johnny was doing seven minutes of very topical humor. That's what Jay started doing, but he expanded it to about 14 minutes, and he added something to the monologue that Johnny wasn't doing so much, which is a political sensibility, a topicality. He brought that to the monologue to the point where the monologue of record in Washington, D.C. was Jay Leno's monologue. Fantastic. And he brought that to the guest segments, too, I think. And I would agree with you. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today on the Home Movie Legacy Project. You've been an awesome guest. And uh, I love your book, Behind the Curtain, an insider's view of the Jay Leno Tonight Show. I hope everyone will run right out and get it. Have a great day. That's a wrap, everybody. See you next week. Thank you for being part of the Home Movie Legacy Project with your host, Rhonda Vidjid, here on Rockstar Worldwide. Each week, you'll learn how to take an oral history and a compelling story that will make your great-great-grandkids laugh and make your parents feel young again and get that Generation Y interested in their family tree. 
This is a different kind of reality show, one that is revealed through the stories and frames shot long ago. So you can shift your focus, transform your understanding, and move forward in your life. The Home Movie Legacy Project. For more on Rhonda and the show, check out our website, homemovielegacy.com. Then be here next week as the journey continues. The Home Movie Legacy Project with Rhonda Vigent. Thursday evenings at 7 Eastern here on Rockstar Worldwide.